It's a bonus episode as Tim Finn talks with Tom Riley, the Duke and future G.I. Joe artist, and Sue Lee, the writer of Chitara at the 80s revival panel at Boston's Wicked Comic Con on 10th of August 2024. Take it away, Tim! Live from the Talking Joe Studios, it's Talking Joe! Talking Joe is on the air. Hey, 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 it's me, Tim, not Mark. This is a special bonus episode of Talking Joe because I was asked to moderate a panel at a comic book convention, and Mark is on the other side of an ocean, and so he wasn't involved. But uh, he suggested that I record it, which is a great idea, so you get to listen to it. Wicked Comic Con took place August 10th and 11th, 2024, in Boston, Massachusetts. This show is very much about uh, dealers selling comics and small publishers selling their comics and comic artists as guests, also some animation voice actors. But this is not about uh, uh, screen actors from movies and television. Uh, There is a lot of cosplay, and there was a lot of kids programming. Recorded live, here is the 80s Revival Panel. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 80s Revival Panel here at Wicked Comic Con. I am your moderator, Tim Finn. I own Hub Comics, a brick-and-mortar shop just a couple subway stops away from here in Somerville. I'm also half of the weekly G.I. Joe Comics podcast, Talking Joe. And uh, I write about G.I. Joe at my blog, arealamericanbook.com. I'm also executive producer at Atomic Aid, which is a hilarious YouTube channel. One of my guests today is writer-artist Sue Lee, who uh, wrote and drew the Disney villains Maleficent miniseries. All right! Wow. Wrote in through the Disney villains Maleficent. <laughs> so it's okay. Text. Take a breath. Uh, Maleficent miniseries for Dynamite, and is currently writing the Thundercats Chitara miniseries for Dynamite. Uh, and our other guest just in, and boy, are his arms tired. Uh huh. Artist Tom Riley, who drew some uh, Superman for Night Terrors for DC, Cool Thing miniseries for Marvel, uh, an Ant Man miniseries for Marvel. Most recently, a G.I. Joe Duke miniseries for Skybound and Image, and upcoming, the monthly G.I. Joe for uh, Skybound and Image. Ladies and gentlemen, Sue Lee and Tom Riley. Awesome. This don't work? No. Awesome. Uh, Hi, Tom. Welcome. Hi. How's it going? Good. Good. Uh, I just want to sort of situate everyone. So we're in Boston right now. Uh, where, Where is home? Where do you work? I live in New York. Providence. So, not too far. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, do you have a dedicated workspace at home or a place you go to write and or draw? Um, wherever I work in my home. <laughs> it's everywhere. No, but um, I work at home. Um, I have a little office space, and my part of my living room is also an office space. It's very weird. I live in New York. It's a very small apartment. Um, I have a dedicated studio space. I just bought a house, so I have... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's possible in comics. This, this, this dedicated studio space. Uh, separate separate house. Uh, it's Northern another... Light, skylights. Just right? another room in the house. Okay. But not, not possible in New York, though. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you can't buy a house there. Before this house, I was working out of... A three by six foot closet in my bedroom. So it's an upgrade. Comics! Yeah. (laughs) It's cooler than it sounds, but Uh, I'm glad to be out. uh, So, Tom, uh, you have finished the Duke miniseries, and G.I. Joe is upcoming. And, Sue, uh, issue two of uh, Thundercats Chitara is out, I think, this past week. What are you working on right now to, to further situate us? I'm working on G.I. Joe number one right now. Which I'm, is which is out in November. In November, yeah. 
How, how's that going? Uh, I'll be working on it later tonight in the hotel room. <laughs> it's going good, but with the move to the house and stuff, yeah. pages are coming along a little slower than I would like, but I'm getting it done. So, uh, Sue, what are you working on right now? Uh, right now, I am working on a thing I can't talk about, <laughs> um, and then some covers that was randomly placed upon me like while I was on the train. Um, and then, so Wizard of Oz got announced during San Diego Comic Con. So I'm currently, I also have to work on those pictures in the hotel room tonight as well. All right, so you're drawing a Wizard of Oz uh, issue, miniseries? It's a, it's a graphic novel adaptation of okay. the movie. Uh, which publisher? Dynamite. Okay. Are you still are you still writing Chitara, or have you finished All that? Done. Okay. What is your general familiarity with these two particular 1980s pop culture brands? What is your connection to Thundercats? What is your connection to G.I. Joe? I watched Thundercats, but it was like an on and off thing. It wasn't like, you know, when I used to watch Thundercats, it was something that was like replaying on, you know, like Cartoon Network or something like that. And it was like nothing, right? Nothing that was, um, you know, too crazy. It was in the periphery, but not like anything I was like seeking after. Um, I do know that it is the most iconic Western cartoon intro, though. And so I think, if anything, that was the most memorable part. Um, and then when they asked me to write Chitara, I was like, okay, I got to rewatch the cartoons than I did. And like, I was surprised at how short the episodes were. I think it was like 20 minutes or 15 minutes per episode. I was like, oh, this is it. I, I think there are 95 yeah. episodes of the uh, original series <laughs> or 105 episodes of the original series. I'm just, was, yeah, I'm just going to assume like, you watched them all. It's like 10 seasons or something like that. It's, 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 it's four seasons. Well, it, it's like, you're right, like 90 episodes or whatever each. It's very short but very long um, series of seasons. Uh, Tom, what is your connection to G.I. Joe? My connection to G.I. Joe, I'm pretty sure everyone has had a G.I. Joe toy, whether they've known it or not, before yeah. in their life. And I know all like the characters. Cobra is one of maybe the most iconic villain lineups. I think everyone probably knows Cobra Commander, at least visually. Cobra so, <laughs> Yes. Speaking of iconic openings, exactly. the animated movie I just watched, and the intro to that is amazing. Incredibly well animated, but my connection to G.I. Joe is a little bit less firm than the writers and kind of showrunners of the Energon Universe stuff, like Robert and Josh. Robert Kirkman. Robert Kirkman and Josh, and Josh Williamson, yeah. Because they kind of grew up in the 80s, and they were kind of living it as, it as it came out. I came around a little bit later than them, so... I was not totally in it like they are, but I don't know that I really need to be a super expert on this stuff because we are trying to kind of come up with new stories for new kind of people to come in and get interested in the properties. So Josh and Robert, Daniel, Warren Johnson, those guys can have the encyclopedic knowledge to maybe selectively put things in that fans are expecting and then to have me come in that maybe doesn't have so much of that knowledge, I can put sort of a new spin on stuff that I don't necessarily have the knowledge for. I like that response. I think there is this idea sometimes that to, uh, to be uh, an actor in a comic book movie, uh, it helps if that actor is a fan read the issues from the 70s or from the 90s or from 2005 or to work on one of these brands that's been around for a while uh, to be a fan. And I think it can help, and it certainly makes the fans feel better. But I think the, the minimum is to be a professional, right? Are you an actor? Can you memorize lines? Can you embody this character? Can you, like, it's up, it's, if it's not in the script, the movie script, if it's not something that the director of that film can communicate to the actor, then then whether or not that actor has read some comics from 30 years ago isn't going to make a difference. And similarly, like there's no test. Like, are you Thundercats fan enough? Uh, there's or a little bit of a test. Okay, <laughs> from the fans. <laughs> okay, and the people who made this stuff in the 80s 
weren't fans because it hadn't existed yet. They were building it. And so, so I, I feel like each generation, uh, there's going to be this mix of people who know it and who are new to it. And as long as they're all putting in uh, good work uh, in, in good faith, it's going to turn out well. Can you talk about your collaboration, your process with your collaborators? So, uh, so Sue, on this, on this Disney Villains Maleficent miniseries, um, you wrote and drew. Mm -hmm. Uh, on Thundercats Chitara, you are writing. Can you talk about your back and forth with the artist, with the editor? Can you talk about um, how you uh, structure a script, how you actually deliver uh, stuff? Is it a script? Is it a plot? Can you get into that? Yeah, so to tie into what you said before, for Chitara, um, it's cool, just like how Tom says you don't need to really know anything because he's... His I know some is, stuff. No, no, I mean, like, his team is making a universe that you can, you're can. you welcome to just jump into. For Chitara, I'm, it's the prelude to the actual cartoon, so you don't even have to know anything about Thundercats. You can just, like, what happened? This is literally before anything happens. No one knows what happens. There's literally no set lore. There's no, like, um, like thing that you have to go by. So I had to make it a lot of it up. But again, I had to re like literally rewatch the cartoons to like red string the characters and some of the plot lines to make it make sense, and you know really have to to think about what you know what makes sense to the character. I may not know her because Chitar is a character you don't really know anyways in the cartoon. You're just kind of going with the flow, and she's just there um, as a character, you know. But you don't know who she is, so I had to make up who she is. Um, so it's interesting because for Chitara, um, I had to, like, this is my first time really writing a big story and for a artist who's not myself. Like for Maleficent, I wrote like one page, like one word sentences. Sometimes like, she's here. I'll know exactly what that means because I'm drawing for myself. Um, so I was very loose with it and, you know, I had to actually go back with my editor and rewrite certain, uh, dialogue. Cause I'm like, oh, no, no, I don't like the way it is. So it was like a little sloppy because it was me, right? It's not a big deal. But for Chitara, I needed, um, Dominico to understand what I'm saying without giving him too much. So he's not like getting a headache, you know, literally I'll start off with one word synopsis of what, uh, one word, one sentence synopsis of what the page is gonna be. So I said action page, romance page, um, sad page. So he'll like have the mentality of, oh, I know what I'm drawing now without having to go read it, then go back to panel one and then dissect it again. I, I wanted it to be as clear as possible. Um, but then also I'll just be like, here are four panels of action. I trust you as much as other writers would trust me to take liberty into you know drawing it. I don't need to tell him what to draw. He'll he'll figure it out. So I said, make it look good. I said, action, continue, continue. I trust you. And then sometimes that's it for the page. Um, and then he goes with it. And um, oftentimes I'll be like, I, I don't tell him exactly what's happening. I'll just be like, these two characters are in play. This is like with the location, and you know, if someone is sad, make them look sad or happy, and then, you know, you gotta have trust in the artist, like, and writers do. And so, when writers give me a script, they trust me to make sure it's okay. So I don't, I don't want to hold his hand too much, but I wanted to make sure it's, he's also taking, you know, um, center stage into art, right? Like, I'm just a writer, you know, and I can finally say that for the first time. And so I wanted him to shine, and I think the book looks beautiful. So it, it was really interesting dynamic. I had to really focus on it, because Maleficent was super easy for me. All right, so Chitara, it sounds like you're handing over uh, a, 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 a script that's not dense or yeah. overly detailed. No. Are you adding dialogue later to the finished art? You are including... No, no, I am like really like hashing out the complete dialogue making like sense i literally say it out loud in my head i have you know non-comic normie friends like read the script to see if it makes sense to them if you're reading it um, instead of you know as an artist or something because um, right a reader is different than someone who's like actually creating it it's there's like a weird thing that happens to your brain i don't know it's, it's, it's the same for you it is yeah tom can you talk about how you are working with your with your writer on these on this mini series and this upcoming series uh, and and how it's how the work is coming out 
Uh, yeah. It, like Sue said, it's a very collaborative process. So I will get a script not too dissimilar from what Sue gives to Dominico. Um, and I will draw it. <laughs> There's like a number of panels that they'll want me to draw on a page, Josh. And if like, usually if there's something he really wants me to draw on the page, he'll let me know. But other than that, he'll sometimes just put like go nuts on this fight scene or whatever in the script and he can just let me do whatever I want. And uh, sometimes dialogue will change from what is in the original script to like the final art. Maybe just based on something that I drew that was a little different than what he thought oh, was going to come cool. out. Yeah, and uh, it's very fun. Are you uh, all right? So Duke and GI Joe are part of the Energon universe, which involves Transformers and also yeah. Void Rivals. Are you contacting the other artists and writers of those books? Not so much me. I will talk to other artists a little bit just for some visual continuity because there are mm -hmm. things that appear in multiple books and you want to make sure that you're drawing them correctly. Sometimes these things that appear in another issue of a book like haven't been fully drawn yet. So mm -hmm. like, it's, like someone's office. You see the corner of it. But yeah. You haven't seen the, the larger room. Yeah, or like some item that's important in one story and it pops up in another and like they're actively drawing that issue and you kind of have to wait to draw that till they get it like figured out there's so there's a balancing act between these sorts of things okay. um so that's about as much as i'll do is i'll ask my editors for some visual reference and stuff um but can we answer um, questions or are we doing them after we do questions at the end okay uh, usually josh is the person who gets all that stuff together. Uh, both of these brands are owned by companies that are not comics publishers. Warner Brothers owns Slendercats. Hasbro owns G.I. Joe, which adds a layer of uh, excitement and complexity to making these stories. How, how does that affect your, your writing, your drawing? Or, or are you aware of that added layer? Hasbro is actually pretty cool to work with. Um, they're very accepting of pretty much everything that I'm putting out, which is great because they work in toys. That's like a big part of that is the visuals of the toys, how they look. I'm coming up with a lot of original designs for the book and they could easily have just said, we've got this new line of toys coming out, just make them look like the toys that we're selling. And they have not done that. So they're open to a lot of original ideas and it's surprising. Honestly, it's surprising. You, you were you were perhaps ready for more rigidity or pushback. Sometimes with these licensed books, there can be some pushback just based on what they have coming down the pipeline. And they want you to make things kind of sync up with what they're selling at the moment. That's just how it works. But they have not done that so far. It's been very fun. Uh, G.I. Joe, famously in the 1980s, the, the monthly Marvel comic had to hit certain uh, 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 marks in the schedule to line up with when certain toys were appearing at retail. And it was the challenge for those comics artists to know how to draw a tank from all angles because maybe they didn't get the actual yeah. toy, yeah. just a photo of it yeah. from the front. So how is it? Uh, how how aware are you of, of Warner Brothers or or a rights holder? So actually, I'm surprised that they're as lax as they were because I had friends like ten years ago who were like, I can't draw Dana Joe, they won't let me because I don't know how to draw a certain thing. I was like, oh, they were very strict, and so I'm very surprised that they're more lax now. Um, so for Maleficent, Disney is a hard customer to please. <laughs> they're very strict on everything that you do. I had like a list of, well, okay, so, you know, they're like, okay, send us the pitch and, you know, whatever. And they come back with a document note with like just very like straight to the point notes. And I was like, oh, why didn't you tell me this before? That's cool. And then I would make changes to it. So they're very strict. Don't like avoid the, uh, the uh, movie. Don't do before. Don't do this after. Don't make sure there's no X, Y, Z. It's Disney, so no blood, no 
violence of, you know, that's terrible or like, you know, explicit things, right? right. No cigarette smoking, stuff like that, right? Um, so, but that's, you know, to be expected. Um, and for Chitara, Warner Brothers have been super cool too. I was actually very surprised. They were like, they haven't really given me much notes at all. If, if anything, that's my editor. He's, but they're like, do whatever you want with it. And it's been very like easy, just like Hasbro. Mm -hmm. So that was surprising. Uh, can you two talk about how you were asked to join these projects or how you uh, networked to make them happen? How did you get on board uh, with this Thundercats miniseries? Well, I think Thundercats was super, like, it's probably one of the highest selling number ones in a long time. And so within that success, I think they were like, well, what's another character that they can, you know, kind of like jump off of? And I think Chitara was like the most natural. Like, I know there's a character, I know people want Panthero as well, <laughs> but Chitara, I think, is a great next step. Um, and I've worked with Nate, my editor, for this, for Maleficent. I've worked on with him for other books as well, Wizard of Oz. So he was just like, do you want to write it? It was very random. I was at a hotel. I was like a, in a hotel at a convention, and he, was, he emailed me. And he's like, hey, you want to have a talk on the phone about a project? I was like, sure. You, you hadn't said, if you have any toy-based miniseries, no, no. here's my hat. It's in the ring. No, I've been <laughs> very lucky where you know, I have like very, you know, good editors that I've worked with for a long time who's trusted me to, you know, make sure the characters are good. So they trust my abilities and, you know, he's just like, I, I know someone in my head. So thankfully I have that relationship with him. Uh, was there any chance that you were going to write and draw Chitara or schedules didn't, because, um, because you had written yeah. and drawn a previous project for the same publisher? He just came to me for writing, and I didn't question the art part. At first, in my mind, my instinct is like, no, no. Why, if you're gonna, if I'm gonna write it, I might as well draw it too. But then I was like, no, no. I don't. I literally don't have time to draw it as well. So just writing was happy. And then he asked me to do covers, so I'm doing covers. This is cover A. I'm doing the main covers from two to five. So everything should. It, it all worked out. Tom, how did you get connected with uh, Skybound? Uh, and the Energon universe. Um, you just mentioned schedules, <laughs> and a lot of this comes down to scheduling. I've been trying to work with pretty much all of the people I'm working with now for the past several years, and just either Josh is working on something for DC, or I'm working on something for Marvel, or Skybound doesn't have like the book that they wanted to work on yet, or something like that. I was trying to work with Josh on something since like 2020, like four years. So eventually all of our schedules aligned and we were able to just kind of converge on this one book. And uh, that started with Superman, I think, last year. I finally got to work with Josh on Superman. It's a two-issue miniseries? Just the two issues for that summer event. Ties in with Night Terrors, no. like with a K, like Nightmare? Yes. And... Uh, during that time, Josh was involved with the Energon universe stuff, and he just asked me if I wanted to jump right on that after the after the Superman book, and I said yes. So, so a big part of comics is timing. Maybe yeah. like at least half of the getting a job is is it like right place, right time stuff? Because both of you are freelancing. Yeah, and and you you have your current job, but. At a certain point, this mini series wraps up, and then you've got a hole in your schedule. And so you are spending a little, a lot of your time working with editors or friends to line up the next job? It depends. Sometimes you've got a job lined up. Yeah. We're, we're very lucky in that sense that we have stuff lined up pretty much for the next X amount of time. Yeah. And I think editors kind of know when you're working on a book and when you're Done. coming off a book and you'll get approached near the end of like something that you're doing by several editors or jobs. So I, I think sometimes there's an idea in comics because we, we might have favorite runs by a writer and an artist that lasted for many years and that that team or that artist was either a staff artist or like had a guarantee of a certain amount of work and and 
in today's comics, there's a lot more freelancing going on. Mm -hmm. So I, I think readers may not be aware of this sort of continual juggling act. A friend of mine freelances for Marvel and DC, and he's getting more work at one of the publishers, but then an editor at the other one says, do you want to do a cover? And he doesn't want to say no, because he doesn't want to seem like he doesn't want to work for them anymore, but then he's got to fit it into his schedule. Oh, yeah. So it's, this, it's, it's a juggling act. Um, all right, so G.I. Joe is a particular kind of book because uh, it's action and there's also equipment. There are vehicles yes. um, and, and weapons. Whereas The Thing or uh, Ant-Man or Superman are superhero books. Yeah. Can you talk about how drawing these different kinds of books uh, requires different approaches or, or skills? Sure. For a superhero book, it's more bombastic fantastical stuff. You can fudge a lot. Can you give an example? What, what would you fudge? Like, just, there's not anything super rigid, like a tank or a fighter jet, that you kind of have to draw the if, correct way. If, Otherwise, if, it kind of looks weird. If Superman's punching a monster, the monster doesn't have to make sense. I can just make that thing up. Some weird tentacle creature you've never seen before, that's fine. But having, like... If I got to draw an aircraft carrier or something, there's a different kind of set of rules in my brain. I've got to switch on to draw something that is like that's a real thing that I have to translate onto the page. So, is this also technical? Or are you using different tools? To, uh, not to draw? really. I mean, like, I'm thinking of a, of, a, of a straight edge or a French curve. I always start out using a ruler, and then I just end up throwing it away and <laughs> just freehanding it. But a lot of straight lines. A lot of very mechanical curve lines. I should get a French curve. Yeah, maybe they sell them here. Uh, I, I think there are art stores. I think there are art supply stores here. Yeah. I was thinking on the floor. They should sell oh, art supplies okay. at these. Yeah. Sue, so are there... I, I, I feel like Maleficent and Chitara are, are maybe more similar than dissimilar. Um, fantasy and sci-fi fantasy. Um, are there some differences that I'm not picking out that... Uh, I know one book you wrote, Andrew, and one book you're writing, but is there is there something maybe in your covers for Chitara that uh, require a different approach from your interiors and covers for Maleficent? Yeah, um, for Maleficent, I wanted to go... I'm very like graphic with my inks, so I wanted to be very um, true to that. And also, um, the backgrounds have a lot of uh, uh, personality. Like in the original cartoon animated movie, um, it's part of the environment is part of the, the story, right? It's very beautiful. So I wanted it to um, reflect in the story as well, because you know, Snow White is like I mean, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty. It's very like beautiful and like uh, vibrant and lush, and that's the same for Maleficent. But she's evil, so I wanted to make sure everywhere she goes, it's just like darkness follows her. But for the covers of Chitara, it's a whole other thing. It's the very like um, psychic abilities. Maleficent is more like uh, she has, you know, she's kind of like a witch, right? So she has like these uh, physical powers. I don't know if that makes sense. They're magical, but she has like a wand, and you know, they cast a spell. Uh, for Chitara, it's all in her mind. So I had to like go for a more dreamy cover, uh, something more light, something more um, ethereal, you know. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it's like a hundred percent a different like um, switch of like what the vibe I want to be is. Mm. Um, I just had someone who was like, "Oh, I like cover one, but I like cover two. I haven't read the book, but I'm just gonna get it because I like the cover. Because <laughs> I guess it's because it, it shows how like um, delicate it is, right? Um, I wanted to show that like Maleficent is completely the opposite of motherly." Chitara is very motherly, so I wanted to reflect, like, I wanted it to be very, very different than Maleficent. I mean, they're not even the same character, but, you know, I wanted the the, um, the vibe to be very, very different from what anything else would be, for sure. Um, are you both drawing on paper? How much uh, are you using in the way of digital tools, and, and what, are your, what are your preferences? What are the advantages of one or the other? Um, I digitally pencil and I uh, traditionally ink. So I will pencil digitally, print it out, and then ink it on top of that. 
you're, you're printing light blue on full yes. size Bristol? Yes, and you're, then color as well too. Yeah. Okay, so your printer can print 11 by 17. Yes, I Going bought in. an expensive one just so it can do that. <laughs> Tom? Um, I draw pretty much all on paper. I'll do my layouts on just 11 by 17, or no, 8 by 11 copy paper. And then I'll scan those in, and I will also print the blue lines on 11 by 17 paper. But then I will pencil and ink everything traditionally. So you can't sell a digital page. Ah. Well, you, mm. you can't sell a digital page. How, uh, how, how, how important has having the object and being able to sell it? That's, that's a, I mean, you, you have representation. There, there's an agent who sells your art? Yes. This is a big deal. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay. Telling people you got a, an art rep always feels pretty Fancy. pretty sweet. And, and, and having a secondary source of income. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So you are on the con floor today. With uh, the art rep, yeah. Uh, with the <laughs> She's art She's here. Uh, are you also both here tomorrow? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So are you, are you sketching for money? Are you doing autographs? Uh, yeah, all, all of, of it. All of the above, yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we don't have the same art rep anymore. No, but, we don't. But we're friends, so. <laughs> okay. Any questions yeah. from the audience? And I'm going to ask you to try and boil your question down to its its shortest version possible. Whoa. I know we've got some time. I know there's not a big crowd, but I think we've all been at some panels and conventions where someone has a very long introduction to their question. What's the short version of your question? Any hands uh, in the center? <laughs> Possible for, for for somebody to for you to add a new character in your in your GI Joe comic. There actually is going to be a new character in GI Joe number one. Can I can I repeat the question? Is it possible, Tom, for you to add a new character to your GI Joe series? It is, and it's being done right now. That those decisions are above my pay grade, <laughs> but I do get to come up with the visual identity of the character, what they look like, so. If you pick up G.I. Joe number one in November, you'll see the brand new character. This, this guy's on the cover. And we've seen He's on the cover. cover. He's on right. the cover. So you, you can tell us his name? I don't think I can tell the name. Oh. Okay. I don't remember. I think we did at San Diego <laughs> reveal his name, but I don't fully remember and I don't want to get in trouble. But he's all, he's brand new. Is, is there is there a, a description or a cue from uh, the plot or the writer that informed your design of this character that you can talk about? I'll get, yeah. His specialty or his attitude? I'll get like a broad description of what they want the character to be. Uh, ethnicity, background, what they kind of want him to be wearing. Um, and then they just kind of let me do several variations. And you always got, you want to come up with a couple different takes on a character and see what sticks. And then you kind of combine elements of... Mm -hmm. Kind of the things that you've made up, and then Hasbro's got to sign off on it because it's theirs. It's theirs. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in three years, this new character will have an action figure. Who knows? Maybe. Okay. It's important. I know this is a toy company, Hasbro. I have not gone into the design process for these characters, just thinking about toy stuff. Like, oh, this would make a sweet toy. It's like. Story related, narrative stuff, cool, like comics related design decisions. Um, I do think they'd make pretty cool toys, though. Was there a question in the front row? Yes. Uh, the 80s weren't as diverse and inclusive, yeah. I would say, as we're, the times we're living in today. So, what have you noticed about intentional and deliberate conversations? Was this? Can I repeat the question? Yes. Uh, the 80s were not as diverse um, uh, as, as uh, brands and characters are now. What have you noticed about... The projects that you're working on. The projects that you're working on now. Or, or how, how, can you, how can you inform uh, that change now? So the cool thing about Thundercats is they're anthropomorphs. They're like just a bunch of furries, right? So they, they don't really have like, you know, we don't know. They're just tigers or lions, right? So that's the nice thing. But um, for instance, Chitar is the only female adult in Thundercats. We don't really know anything about her. Um, and so I think, you know, good on Nate for having like a, you know, woman writer writing Chitara. Like who else, like, you know, 
I don't know if a man could honestly like write Chitara, like because you have to really go into the psyche of a woman who has a lot of like these powers that she doesn't know. So I'm like, okay, that's natural for a woman, right? Like we have you know, uh, instincts that we may not listen to or like not understand. So that's a lot of what Chitar is about. Um, motherly aspect, sure. Cause you know, if you look, if you watch episode one, she's like one of the first people that like is introduced and Lionel like talks to. So I think, well, why is that? Is it because she's the woman? So she's the, naturally the mom. And if that's so, I have to create like a real story behind that. And so that was like really interesting. And I thought, no, no, I, I could make this like very like cool and like bro -y or whatever. But I was like, no, no, it's about a woman. I want to make sure this makes sense to me, to other women. Um, you know, like it's subtle things that I want to talk about. I'm not like, she turns a woman. Like, yeah, obviously. No, no, I, I want it to be like a really, you know, thoughtful, insightful way of like inner struggle, like her abilities, her power, like womanhood, but not in your face, it, just in a way where like, and no one dismisses her. This book isn't like the stereotypical, like the men are like, nah, I'm not listening. No, they're like, no, no, we know you. We, we trust that you're strong. We know what you do. So I'm like, I think, you know, uh, that's very important. So like me writing it was very cool uh, because I wanted to do good by her. But then also uh, Nate and I were like, do you have an artist in mind? We have someone in mind, but what do you think about this? And we didn't want cheesecake. Like none of my covers are like overtly sexual because you know, other cover artists did that. That's fine. That's them. I don't, you know, they look all great, but I, I you know, she's like a very interesting, cool, like strong character, you know? Um, even if you look at the, watch the cartoons again, she's very cool. Like she's very interesting. She's still a like, very, like I like her. There's an episode where she's like, I like gold. Like there's an episode they discover gold and she's very into it. And I was like, she's just like me, <laughs> right? But um, you know, it, it's like, I wanted someone who wasn't gonna like overtly sexualize her, make her like, you know, too curvaceous and like just the, 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 I wanted her to be just the main character, like every other dude. And Dominico did such a good job. Like when I looked at the design, I was like, oh no, it's him, he's doing it. Like nothing is crazy, but she looks, beautiful still and amazing so you know in terms of diversity like again she's not really a human so we don't have to worry about that but I wanted to make sure it's um, very inclusive to women so hopefully people who like Thundercat and a lot of you know men come up and buy the books and so okay I hope that's like you know <laughs> making you rethink some things or whatever but I want women to also be introduced into this you know very like uh, male centric like cartoon you know, so hopefully it, it works. <laughs> uh, Sue, you've also used the word um, motherly, I think twice. And, and for those of you who aren't uh, the biggest Thundercats fans, maybe a, a good reminder that in the story, lion -O is a kid yes. and he ages uh, in the first yes. couple of episodes. So he's now an adult, but he's got the uh, maturity of a kid. And so in, in the flashbacks in this story, uh, he's a kid and Chitara is a grown up. Yes, yeah. If I can tee you up a little bit with that same uh, question, Tom, uh, that new character on the cover to G.I. Joe number one, not a white guy. Not a white guy. But G.I. Joe, historically, the roster has been pretty yeah. diverse. Pretty diverse. I mean, it's Larry Hama, right? Larry Hama, the yeah. legend. Yeah. There's someone on G.I. Joe that I think anyone can identify with. Most people. They're all badass. I like the one with the glasses, the woman. Yeah, the Baroness. She's awesome. Stalker. <laughs> What's her name? <laughs> Stalker in the comics led the team for a long time. So it, it's always been, it, like, I feel like, yeah, surprisingly sure. inclusive, diverse roster of characters. Yeah, Scarlet the, is awesome, too. These, these two action figure lines in the 80s were very specifically boys' brands. Yeah. And this is the division which, which the toy companies embraced and accelerated. Uh, and... It was the advertising agencies, it was the licensing partners that were saying, you have to include some women. We can't have a TV show or we can't have a comic book with six guys. That can't be the, the team. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be a comic book, there has to be at least one uh, woman, there has to be a black guy, etc. Uh, and, and so these brands, uh, these brands continued to add, uh, maybe not by volume, uh, enough diversity, but there always was uh, was some. Um, 
Can I get a time check? I don't oh, know where yeah. we are. My phone has been dead. Oh, are we wrapping up at the 45? Are we plowing all the way to one? Cool. Uh, are there other questions from the crowd? Maybe someone in the middle rows or in the back rows? I'm going to repeat this question. Freelancers, uh, how do you how do you handle uh, health insurance and 401ks and buying houses? Got to line up enough projects to pay that stuff off. So you mentioned slotting things into your schedule where they'll fit. So I'm not just working on GI Joe. I'm doing covers for DC. I'm doing covers for Marvel. I'm doing various little things here and there to pad out the stats a little bit. On I, my I, I, hear you, I hear you're selling pages at a convention. Selling pages at a convention. We actually do come here to uh, make money. As fun as this is, I am on a business trip right now. Yeah. So, And selling original art also helps. Doing commissions. There's many streams of revenue that you can kind of tap into when you are a freelancer, which is good. Um, sometimes opportunity has to kind of strike at the right time, though, and... Luck has to be on your side, but we have thankfully been able to make it work. Been very fortunate in that regard. So, uh, fingers crossed. Sue, do you want to? Do you have any stories about health insurance or four hundred one k's? I live in one of the most expensive cities in America, so I unfortunately will never buy a house there. Perhaps if I move away one day, I, I can. Four hundred one k. I do have an IRA that I have not contributed to in a long time. That's the IRA, yeah. <laughs> um, I do have health insurance because I take advantage of the government. And then also I have private insurance like dental and eye, which is everyone should get. It's very cheap if you go to third party and a private one. It's important. <laughs> my eyes are, without my eyes, I can't work. So uh, that, um, and also I work all day, every day. I take multiple jobs because I can't own a house. I have to, you know, tech is very expensive in New York. Um, I don't have a life. I work all the time. <laughs> this is like my time off. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'll wrap this up with two uh, mini questions. What other conventions uh, do you have scheduled for the rest of the year? Sue, Tom? Um, I have a library hosted show in Boise, Idaho. I, I feel like small towns don't get a lot of you know conventions, so I'm happy to spread Chitara to the wind. Um, and then also I'll be in uh, LA Comic Con, New York Comic Con, and I think that's it. Okay. I will be at New York Comic Con in October, and I'll be at Motor City Comic Con in Detroit in November. And that might be it for me this year. Do you take breaks throughout throughout the no. day? I'm taking a break right now, yeah. Yeah, this is my break. Yeah, to eat. Okay. You do have to eat. Um, even then, I'll sometimes like eat while I'm working or stand in the kitchen and eat so then I can get back to work. I think it's important to take breaks. I will try and take breaks. Just go play PlayStation for an hour or something. No, I don't do that. To definitely go from sitting at a drawing do table to sitting at a... Oh. Yeah. No, yeah. you gotta have leisure time. That informs the work. Not if you're me. if you're busting it just all day, you're gonna get tired. You're gonna get burnt out. You need a little bit of leisure time in there. Go hang out with the girlfriend for a little bit. Go play fetch with the dog, something like that. <laughs> my my encouragement for my students and advice I hear from my freelancer friends is to uh, get outside. Yes. Uh, like go for hikes, exercise. Exercise. Oh, I do exercise. That's my one break of the night. That like counts. Like three in the morning, though. <laughs> I only go out, literally outside of my house, three or four times a month. Four is the max. I don't leave. I'm not joking. Like, I don't I don't even, sometimes I'll go to check the mail real quick, and I'll run, and I'll come back, and I'll work. <laughs> but three times is like the max allotment I go outside to do stuff or a show. This is, this is a hard job. I'm very job. unhealthy. This Don't is, follow my... Uh, this is a hard job, folks. And yeah. I would like to thank our guests, uh, Sue Lee and Tom Riley, for their hard work uh, and showing up for this little break. Uh, welcome. Uh, that's it for this panel. I'm going to sit up here for a minute and take a picture with our two guests with my uh, camera, and then we're going to clear here for the next panel. Uh, thank you all. Just let me... Like, uh,
So that's the 80s revival panel. Thanks for listening. Uh, just a couple other fun bits about the convention. Other guests who have a G.I. Joe connection include artist Alex Sovic, best known for Web of Spider-Man, uh, Spider-Man Adventures, and the daily Amazing Spider-Man newspaper strip. He had a pinup in issue 150 of Marvel G.I. Joe. Andrew Lee Griffith was at Wicked Comic Con. He drew a couple issues of Real American Hero for IDW before that series wrapped up there. Although for me, uh, as much of a G.I. Joe artist as he is, he's, he's even more of a Transformers artist. Uh, Adam Hughes was uh, present. Adam Hughes has drawn a uh, Scarlet pinup for uh, Marvel back around issue 110 and also a uh, Baroness cover that Devil's Do did not get to publish and IDW did. I would like to thank Colin Solon of Wicked Comic Con for asking me to moderate this panel. It was fun. The show was great. Thanks to our Patreon backers. All of our links are at talkingjoe.co.uk. You can find me at my comic book store, Hub Comics, at atomicabe.com, and I write about G.I. Joe at a realamericanbook.com. Uh, that's it. And remember, the jingle that we sign off with involves me singing, Nobody Beats Talking Joe, an international podcast! Later. <laughs>